Okay, so if you're ready, um, let's start with, uh, with our last chapter. Uh, if you remember, last week we talked about, oh no, last Tuesday, we talked about the first chapter of capital budgeting, and we talked about different methods to pick which investments are good, which investments are bad. Um, remember, with the capital uh, budgeting uh, chapter, what we are trying to do is we need to uh, come up with cash flows related to the uh, investments. Um, and once we have the, the cash flows for the period of the investment life, then we're going to discount all those cash flow values. And then we will try to figure out whether it's a good project or not. And we said most of the time CFOs use MPV, which is the difference between present value of uh, inflows and present value of outflows. And we said this is the easiest one to use, let's say. But in this one, we need to be careful about the discount rate. We are using the discount rate in the economy, which is your opportunity cost of the capital, basically. Uh, and, um, and another thing we said was um, we have to be careful about scaling. So big, very big project uh, for very big companies, uh, a positive MPV project with like $1 positive M MPV wouldn't mean a lot. But the decision rule is MPV greater, if MPV is greater than zero, we take the project. Then we talk about IRR, and IRR is the rate of return which makes MPV equal to zero. So is the rate which makes NPV equal to zero. So what does it mean? It means if the um, IRR is higher than the cost of capital in the economy for, for that investment, then you take the project. So that's when the NPV should be uh, greater than zero, basically. And for those kind of uh, IRR is good because it ignores the, the scaling of the projects. We are just talking about some rates. We don't have to be very specific about the opportunity cost of capital like uh, we should in MPV. And then uh, what we said, but we said MPV has, uh, sorry, IRR has some kind of problems like um, in the lending on or borrowing decision, uh, IRR of the, the two things can be the same, whereas uh, lending at 50% might be a good thing, borrowing at 50% may be a bad thing. So you need to be careful about the sign of cash flows. The second one is if you have more than one uh, uh, sign uh, change for the cash flow, then you will have multiple IRRs. So normally for one IRR, you need to have one uh, change of sign for the cash flow. If you have two changes in the cash flow, then you're going to have two IRRs. So which will be, it will be confusing which IRR you're going to take uh, for the decision rule. So that's another problem. And when you have mutually exclusive projects, and when I say mutually exclusive projects, I, I mean uh, projects that cannot be together, uh, taken at the same time. You have to pick one, not the other one. Uh, so you have to go with, with one project. When you have mutually, mutually, mutually exclusive projects, then uh, I would go with the MPV rule first, because sometimes MPV and IRR uh, do not agree. So you should go with uh, MPV first and then use IRR as a um, double check, let's say. Um, and then we said, um, oh, another assumption with IRR is IRR assumes reinvestment at the IRR, not at the discount rate, which is not very realistic. So according to IRR, whenever you're discounting the cash flows or whenever you're thinking about investment of cash flows uh, you, you make from, uh, from the project, uh, IRR assumes that you are reinvesting at the IRR rate. So we said, okay, we can use MIRR, which is the modified internal rate of return. This is more realistic because it assumes reinvestment at the opportunity cost of capital in the economy. The second thing is it doesn't, um, it, it, it's not affected when you have multiple uh, cash flow sign changes. So remember, if you have more than one uh, sign change, for, uh, for the project, I, you will have multiple IRRs, which will be problematic. But for mo modified IRR, remember what we were doing it, what, what we were doing was bring all the negatives, neg negative cash flows to the beginning of the project, begin all the positive cash flows to the end of the project, and then from here, find the rate which will make them equal. 
So, so suppose that these are negative cash flows, these are the positive cash flows value. So it's going to be something like this. So you're going to take, you're going to find MIR, MIRR from this equation. So this is the present value of all the negative cash flows. These are the future value of all the positive cash flows. So the rate that will make those equal will be MIRR. The rule is the same. If MIRR is higher than the interest rate, discount rate in the economy, you accept the project. So it's the same thing. What else did we talk about? Oh, payback periods, uh, payback, payback methods. That was the easiest one. According to the payback method, um, you, you calculate the time that's necessary to recover your cash flow, your initial investment. Uh, I don't know how to write it, but uh, in the payback period uh, rule, you uh, accept all the projects whose payback period is less than the cutoff point that the manager determines, basically. So how long it will take for you to recover your initial investment. So that was the payback period. And then we had the profitability index, and I think that was the last thing. Profitability index. And this was what? I think it was MPV over the initial investment. So basically it says your, the, the net present value of the project compared to your, uh, the investment you made to the project. Um, if it is greater than one, you should take the project. The higher it is, the better it is. Is that correct, do you think, profitability index? It feels correct. One thing to be careful about for the initial investment, sometimes you write it as negative, and you, uh, you will find profitability index as negative, and then you will say, oh, it's negative, so we shouldn't take the project. No, initial investment will always be negative, because it is cash outflow. So take this as positive. I guess it's a cash outflow, but you're comparing how much money you invest compared to how much money you make. So for initial investment, take it as, as positive. If MPV is negative, it's a bad project anyway. So, of course, you should say profitability index is negative. You shouldn't take it. Does it make sense? Okay. So these are uh, the rules that I could, uh, I could uh, think of. Um, so this part was actually the second step of the capital budgeting part. In this, uh, uh, in this uh, lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to find the cash flows. So we're going to go back to the very beginning. And for that, we need the accounting chapter for sure. Uh, even if it's not in the final exam, you should know the accounting chapters because you will basically calculate the net income. Then you're going to add all the non-cash stuff to it uh, um, to find the, the cash flow for, for uh, the investment. OK, so let's start our very last chapter. And I, we have three, three days left, right, together. It's Tuesday, Friday, and the other Tuesday. Then we will be done. OK. You will have one more lab uh, with, with uh, Khan, lab session. Uh, probably it's going to be next Friday. Uh, but Tuesday, we're going to be together. I'm going to finish this, this chapter. I'm going to solve uh, questions. Today, again, we don't have the internet, so we are, I didn't bring any questions with me. So. We, I had to start the new chapter. But Tuesday, uh, this is what we're going to do, which will be good for the early final takers as well. OK, so cash loss. Um, so what we want to do is we're going to estimate the cash loss. We know how to find the discount rate. We talked about last time. You, you, we have cost of debt or cost of equity. Cost of debt can come from bank interest rates. If, you're, if you take bank loan, uh, then the interest rate you're going to pay the, to the bank is your cost of debt. Or you can issue bonds, which is the form of public debt. And the yield to maturity on the bond will be your opportunity cost of capital. It's, it will be your cost of debt. Cost of equity, you can calculate from CAPM. Or you can calculate it from dividend discount model, for instance. Okay? So once you know the discount rates, and the, the cash flows, you can discount the cash flows uh, appropriately. 
and you can select the projects with positive MPV. So this part you already know. Uh, this, part, uh, this part is what we're going to do in this chapter. So how do we forecast cash flows? So the first thing is, in all those things, we're using actual cash flows, not income, not earnings, not revenues. Okay, We're going to forecast the cash the project will bring or will take from you. Okay, So uh, first, look at this example. And let's see why it is important to use cash flows. Okay, going back to accounting, a project costs two thousand dollars and is expected to last two years. So you're going to pay two thousand dollars for a two-year project, producing cash income of fifteen hundred and five hundred respectively. So the first year you're going to make fifteen hundred, the second year you're going to make five hundred. The cost of the project can be depreciated at one thousand dollars per year. So for the project you're buying a machinery, let's say you pay $2,000 for that machine, and it's going to depreciate by the straight line depreciation technique, $1,000 uh, each year. Given a 10% required return compared to the MPV using the cash flow to the MPV using accounting income. OK, the question is very simple. We have only one cash flow, basically. So if you use the, um, uh, if you use the cash, uh, actual cash, what you have is in the first year, at year zero, you're paying $2,000 for the machine, then you make $1,500 and $500. So these, this is the cash flow you have, right? So if you discount those cash flows at the discount rate, which was 10%, the MPV will be equal to negative 223. This is the MPV, right? Would you accept this project? No, it's a negative MPV project. No, you shouldn't take it. So this is the right way of doing things. You focus on cash flows and then you find the MPV. The wrong way would be using the accounting income. So if you use accounting income, remember, let's go back to uh, chapter three. In accounting, whenever you have a capital expenditure, and buying a machine was capital expenditure, uh, we said, okay, don't put it in the income statement. Those, that $2,000 uh, doesn't go to the income statement. But instead, let's use the depreciation. So let's smooth things out. Instead of uh, spending $2,000 in one year, I mean, this is how it's going to look in your financial statements, let's just spread it over the life of the project and every year deduct $1,000. Bunu hatırlıyor musunuz? Bunu muhasebede böyle yapıyorduk. 2000 dolar harcamayı koymak yerine, çünkü o income'ınızı çok kötü gösterecek. Halbuki iyi bir şey yapıyorsunuz, yatırım yapıyorsunuz. Onun yerine diyorlar ki amortizman olarak biz 2 yıla dağıtalım bunu. Çok da financial statementlarımız etkilenmesin. So, in this case, you're completely ignoring the capital expenditure, $2,000, and use the depreciation. So this is basically the accounting income, right? This is your revenue minus depreciation. Very simple form of the income statement. So in this case, this is how your uh, income would look like, plus 500 and minus 500. Again, if you use the uh, discount rate, 10%, to discount those cash flows, the MPV this time will be positive $41. So basically, for a negative MPV project, if you use the accounting income numbers, you, uh, um, you, you will accept the project and it, it will be bad for you, basically. So in all those chapters, we're dealing with cash flows. That's the first thing uh, to, to uh, think about related to this chapter. OK, so now let's go to the cash flow of things step by step, the, the important points. <laughs> OK. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to figure out what uh, cash flows are. And what we're going to do is actually we're going to focus on incremental cash flows. What is incremental cash flow? For each cash flow, the question you will ask will be like this. Would I have this cash flow if I didn't have the project? OK? If the answer is no then you should consider, consider it as the incremental cash flow. Yani şöyle, her cash flow hesabında diyeceksiniz ki bu, bu, bu projeyi alıp alma, almasaydım bu cash flow hala olacak mıydı? Eğer cevap evetse, yani olacaktı ise o cash flow'u biz ignore ediyoruz. Yani yapmaya çalıştığımız şey projeyle ilgili olan cash flow'ları sadece e, hesaba katmak. Oldu mu Türkçe? Daha mı dağıldı? <gülüyor> Çok basit. Incremental cash flow is the cash flows about the projects. That's it. That's it. If uh, if those cash flows are still there without the project, it's a, 
it, it, you, you don't take it in your con into con uh, consideration. What's it this? Okay, so in this case, let's just go to uh, what the. Um, okay, for the incremental cash flow, again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all the cash flows that will be uh, that that will be affected from the existence of the project. Okay, that that, and we're gonna ignore all the cash flows. Uh, without the project, basically. So the first thing we're going to do is we're, we should include all the indirect effects in our analysis as well. So there are the direct cash flows related to the project, like revenues and costs, but we may also have indirect effects. So let's spend a little bit of uh, time on, on this, try to figure out what indirect effects are. So for the indirect effect rule, since this is about the, these cash flows will be related to the project, you should uh, consider all of those uh, in, in your analysis. And, ooh, okay, let's look at this one. We are the CFO of Hidden Valley, uh, and we're considering building a new salad dressing factory. The new bottled salad dressing will have sales of 1.25 million, but some of those sales, equivalent to $10,000 in free cash flow, will come from consumers who switch from buying Hidden Valley's existing dry pa packet salad dressing. Okay, all this blah blah is you're producing dry packet uh, salad dressing. Instead of it, you decided to produce bottled set of salad dressing. And when you do that, you will have sales of 125, but that uh, $10,000 of this 125 will, be, uh, will come from uh, old co uh, customers who switch from dry packets to the, the bottle. So does this affect our decision to produce bottle dressing is the question. So is this $10,000 incremental cash flow or incremental cash outflow in that case? So you're gonna enter 125 as your revenue for sure. Are, do you need to do anything with that $10,000? The question we should ask ourselves is if uh, Hidden Valley wouldn't produce bottled salad dressing, would uh, this company lose $10,000 worth of customers? No, but for the pro because of this project, they're losing the existing customers to the new product they are, they are, they are making. Remember, this project is all about the new product. So this is indirect effect, and this is a negative indirect effect. Since the company is losing $10,000 worth of customers from the other dry packet uh, product, you should also consider this. Ya hep sorumuz aynı. Bu projeden etkilendiği için mi oldu bu olay? E projeden etkilenildiği için 10 bin dolarlık öbür e, üründe kayıp oldu. Demek ki bu bizim indirect effectimiz. Dolaylı yoldan bir effect var. O zaman biz bunu aslında negatif uh, cash olarak yapıcı, cash out flow olarak konsider etmemiz gerekiyor. E efendim? Ha, uh, yok şey, yani buna göre uh, her ay 10 bin dolar, 10 bin dolar kaybediyoruz gibi. Yani sorunun şeklini o, o şekilde yazmış. Şey, bunlar da intuition anlayın. Uh, o önemli benim için. Zaten örnekler çok basit farkındaysanız. Yani soru şu, proje yüzünden bir değişiklik oldu mu? Proje yüzünden bir değişiklik oldu. O zaman proje iyi mi kötü mü değerlendirirken onu da e, proje e, analizinize katmak zorundasınız. Olay bu. Okay. Another thing is sunk cost. Do you know what sunk cost is? Uh, basically it's the cost that cannot be recovered. Okay. Uh, and the rule is we're going to ignore the sunk cost whenever we are looking at the, the project. Because whether you take the project or not, you already paid that cost and you cannot recover. It's gone. Okay, it's in the past now. So let's look at this example. Hidden Valley plans to use a building that it owns for its new factory. The building was built at a cost of $250,000, which we didn't include in the initial cost of project. Suppose that uh, this, this uh, building was built last year for $250,000. And this year, we're considering to use that factory for the, for the uh, new bottled uh, salad dressing thing. Uh, should we include it to our analysis? 
We don't have to. We did it in the past. Whether we have the project or not, we already paid for this anyway. It's gone. It, it wasn't related to the project. We did it last year. We didn't have the project in mind. Uh, but now it's gone. Whether you, uh, you start the project or not, you still pay 250 So it's, it's gone, basically. So you are not going to uh, include it in, in your analysis. This is a sunk cost. OK. Now, another uh, in, uh, cash flow or another thing we should think of is the opportunity cost. So this is the benefit or cash flow foregone as a result of an action. So since you are taking the project, you will give up some of the things. And this will be called opportunity cost. And we need to recognize opportunity cost in our analysis. So let's look at this example. Hidden Valley plans to use this building that we talk about, which was built for 250. Hidden Valley plans to use a building it owns for its new factory. It could rent the building instead for $15,000 per year. Does this affect our project decision? So because of the project, I will not be able to rent this factory. So this is my opportunity cost of capital. So the existence of the project affected my rent. The, the, so I'm foregoing this rent. So I need to include it in, in my analysis. So this is my foregone uh, revenue, let's say. So every year, I'm going to uh, include this $15,000 in my analysis as my opportunity cost of capital. OK. Um, another thing is the working capital rule. These are the investments in working capital. What does it mean? This is actually the hardest one for you to, to understand. But uh, what was, uh, let's start with the basics, and let me try to explain it to you. What is working capital? Do you remember what working capital was? Asset current. current assets minus current, current liabilities. So every company has some kind of working capital. OK, current assets minus current liabilities. But because of the project, working capital may, may change. And for this, actually, the easiest thing to understand is suppose that you have some no number of labor, OK? And for the project, suppose that you're, you're going to make them overwork over time, work over time. So because of like Christmas time is coming, New Year's uh, Eve is coming for us, and there will be lots of toy production, and uh, the toy production will increase like crazy, especially in US. So companies will use the, the labors uh, for uh, over time, just just before the, the Christmas time. So normally we have some kind of working capital because of the project, working capital will increase, and once the project is is done, working capital will go back to normal. Okay. So the change we have in the working capital should be included in, in our analysis. And you, we will see it in, in examples too. Like sometimes you're going to increase inventory. So this will affect the current assets because of this, like in the toy production example. Uh, or maybe for the project, you're going to use more uh, debt. Current liabilities will be affected. You know, all those, uh, all those should be considered in, in our analysis. So change in working capital is important. Uh, then, if, if we have any terminal cash flows, we need to consider it. When I say terminal cash flow, like, for, for, for instance, if there is like a mining, uh, it, it's a, like a gold mine or, or something like this, uh, there's a cleanup cost when the project is over. So you need to consider this. Or you open a factory, you bought all those machines. At the end of the project, you're going to sell the factory, sell the machines. So if you have a terminal cash flow, we have to consider it as well. Uh, if we have overhead costs, we need to consider it. It's like uh, utilities, like electric, electric stability and everything related to the project. We need to consider it. Uh, and the good thing is we're separating investment and financing decisions. So we are not going to um, take any effects of the financing decisions for the project for now, because it will make everything more complicated. So we're going to say this investment was going to happen. Uh, no matter where the, where, where the money will come from. So we're not going to put the cost of the equity or issues, like the level of amount of cash, or the cost of that in our analysis. Okay? We're going to ignore how the project is financed, basically. OK, so in order, uh, do you have any questions about those things? OK, then let's just, um, oh, OK. Let's look at, go over this question, and then I will talk about the inflation thing one more time. And I think I will just uh, stop here, uh, and we're going to do the evaluations. Um, 
I think it should be okay for today. Okay, this is from your book. Let's read the question uh, very carefully. A firm is considering an investment in a new manufacturing plant. The site already is owned by the company, so you have the land, uh, but existing buildings would need to be demolished. Üzerinde eski püskü binalar varmış, onu yıkmamız gerekiyor. Which of the following should be treated as incremental cash flow? So when I say incremental cash flow, it's all about, uh, don't think it as the like, cash flow, cash flow, but take it as whether the existence of the project affects your decision or not, okay? Whether it's related to the project or not. So would you, would you uh, take the market value of the site into consideration? The market value of the site. So if you sell the land, what would, the, the, uh, what would be the amount of money you would get? Yes, because this is your opportunity cost of using that site, right? Because of the project, you're not going to sell it, so it's your opportunity cost. Yes, you should consider it. The market value of the existing buildings, would you consider it? But can you sell those buildings if you don't take the project? Yes, yes so it's still opportunity cost of capital, so you should still actually consider it. So when you're thinking about the project, there are like millions of things going on, as, as you can see. Demolition, demolition cost and site clearance, would you consider it? Definitely yes. Like for the project, we're going to demolish the buildings and everything. That's a clear yes. The cost of a new excess road put in last year. No, this is sunk cost, right? You did it last year. You don't care whether there's project or not. It's, it's gone. Whether you sell the building, sell the site, you did it already. Like, this doesn't affect your decision. Lost cash flows on other projects due to executive time spent on the new facility. It is opportune to cost, actually. So you should consider it. It's the foregone. Um, no, no, it's like because of the, of the facility that the CEO, because of this new project, the CEO will not be able to work on other projects. So the existence of the project affected this, right? So we should consider it. Also, oh, you're saying, can, I, can we treat it as a sunk cost because it's already <laughs> done? Oh, I didn't think it that way. I actually thought it as like the, when the project is going on, then the CEO will be spending time on the new project. So I, but the way you understood, you're right. Uh, future depreciation of the new plant. Would it, is it about the project? Yes, you're gonna put a new plant and the depreciation, I said like don't think it as the cash flow, cash flow. This depreciation should be in your analysis as well. So th this is the general idea of incremental cash flow thing. Uh, Okay. And the uh, last time you're going to see inflation is in this chapter. Uh, and let's, let's go over the inflation one more time. Uh, and then uh, I will stop. So if you remember, inflation uh, is not our enemy. <laughs> it's our friend, especially in, the, in this class. Uh, the, uh, only in this class, uh, actually. Um, so what we need to do is, as long as you're consistent with your nominal cash flows and nominal interest rate, real cash flows and real interest rate, you should be fine, okay? So there's nothing to be scared of. You already did this for the first midterm, second midterm, you already studied the inflation. There's nothing new here. I will just rem remind you uh, what we did before, that's it. So let's look at this example. You own a lease that will cost you $8,000 this year, increasing at 3% a year. So the inflation rate is 3% um, for three additional years. If discount rate is 10%, this is a nominal discount rate, what is the present value cost of the lease? So I'm going to solve the question using real cash flow, real interest rate, uh, nominal cash flow, nominal interest rate, uh, and we will see they should give the same result. And you remember this probably uh, from the previous exams. Okay, so let's look at the nominal figures. You start with $8,000. Since the inflation rate is 3%, every year the cash flow will increase by 3%. So these will be the nominal cash flows. It, they consider the inflation. So if you discount those cash flows at 10% nominal interest rate, present value will be equal to $29,000. Right? This is the present value of the project. Actually, by the way, this was an old exam question. I asked this two years ago in the first midterm, and the slides were in the 
last chapters uh, topic, as you can see. And almost, I don't know, maybe 5% of students got it correctly. Like, but now you see it's very simple. Maybe at the beginning of the chapter it was difficult, but now it's, it's simple. So these are nominal cash flows. This is the present, uh, net present value of the project. If you use the real cash flows, then what you're going to do, the real cash flows will be fixed at $8,000. But this time, we need to calculate the real discount rate. And real discount rate was very easy to calculate. It is basically 1 plus real is equal to 1 plus nominal over 1 plus inflation. So here, nominal interest rate is 10%, inflation is 3%. So from here, uh, real, cash, uh, real interest rate is 7%. So if you discount all those cash flows at the 7% real, uh, real discount rate, you will get the same present value. So as long as you're consistent with the inflation uh, and your discount rates, you should be fine. Okay? Nothing to, be, to worry about. Okay. Do you have any questions? Uh, then I'm going to stop here. Uh, and I will see you next Tuesday.